that the Lord has shifted me to start a different teaching this week, and so we are going to follow that direction. Uh, the Lord has put it in my heart to teach on the subject of the fear of the Lord. It's a subject that uh, I guess probably in, uh, in my years, I have not heard too many sermons on it. Uh, I've heard uh, John Bevere did a series on it years ago. He did a DVD series and teaching on the subject of the fear of the Lord, uh, and it was really good. But as far as in the church, I have not heard much teaching, and even myself have not done much teaching on the fear of the Lord. And um, the reality is, is the Bible has actually much to say concerning the fear of the Lord. Um, not only from a, an Old Testament perspective, where a, a good part of the scriptures that deal with the subject of the fear of the Lord are in the Old Testament, but uh, there are actually quite a few still in the New Testament, and we're going to look at some of those today uh, concerning the fear of the Lord. I think maybe sometimes the, the idea of the fear of the Lord is uh, people don't understand what it is, and uh, uh, immediately when we think about the subject of fear, we, we immediately have a negative uh, connotation concerning that. And when it deals with the fear of the Lord, we're dealing with, with having a respect for the Lord, an awe for Him, reverence. That's probably a more appropriate word, reverence, to revere, to respect, and to have an awe for the Lord. Um, the Hebrew word... Um, as, as well as the Greek also uh, takes in the idea of uh, trembling, to be in dread and have terror. But when you, you have to look at it within the context of how it's used to be able to figure out what the application is. Is it dealing with a, a terror or dread or being frightened or is it dealing with having the idea of reverence? As you read the scriptures, you can figure out the context. Um, I... I liked uh, uh, the Greek uh, definition uh, means this, to reverence, to venerate. Anybody know what the word, I should have looked that word up. Does anybody know what venerate means? Everybody's in the same boat. What's it mean? To mile down. Venerate, okay. To reverence, to venerate. I like this. And this is as it relates to God, to treat with deference or to defer to. To treat with deference or reverential, and we don't want to forget this word, obedience. So whenever we're, when we're, whenever we're functioning in the fear of the Lord, we're always going to finding our, find ourselves uh, doing the right thing, obeying that which we know and we understand to be the will of the Lord. I like that idea of uh, deferring to. So to me, that implies that we're going to come up against situations in life that we are going to have our will to choose from or His will to choose from. Isn't that right? If I'm deferring to the Lord in, in an area of something, I'm, I'm, there's, there's my will that's, that, that I can consider, or there's His will and or, we could say it this way, His word that I can consider. Anytime that I'm functioning in the fear of the Lord, that I have the fear of God, I'm, I'm reverencing, I'm respect, and I'm in awe of Him, I'm always going to do what? Defer to what He has to say. Even though in my flesh, even how I feel, may seem like I, I want to do this. And everyone in this room, we all deal with that, isn't that right? In life situations, we come up into different situations and circumstances, whether it's re with relationships, whether it's with our money, uh, all, all kinds of different things that we could be doing in life, we're going to have choices. And what we want to do is be people who um, defer, I love that word, who, who in, our, in, our, in our life situations, we're deferring to what God has to say on the matter. Amen? Not how I feel. Not what it looks like. But what does the Father have to say concerning that situation? I think oftentimes in life, we are acting too quickly. We're responding in life way too quickly. And what do I mean by that? I mean that in, when we get into life situations and difficulties, that we, we sometimes feel this outside pressure to, to have to act now. And, and really, that's, that's probably the worst thing that you or I could ever do is just act based on the current information that we have. 
Because <laughs> most of the time, the current information we have is not all the information we need. Isn't that right? Especially when it comes to what does God have to say on the matter. And so a lot of times, we're acting out of what our initial responses are, how we feel in the situation, what I think might be right. But what we need to understand is what I think might be right and how I feel uh, in that situation, acting out of that is probably and might not be the right thing to do. And so we want to be people that are falling back to what God's Word has to say on a situation of life. Because the fear of the Lord, whenever we're functioning in the fear of the Lord, we're, we're going to want to know what God, our Father, our Daddy, Daddy, I like that word, Daddy, what does Daddy have to say about it? Amen? What is Daddy's viewpoint on what's currently going on in my life? What's Daddy's viewpoint on this situation? How would he handle it? How would he act in this situation? What would he say? What would he do? Amen? And so to uh, have the fear of the Lord in our lives, we would be... And let me say this too, everybody in this room, we all, have, we all have room to increase the level of the fear of the Lord in our lives. Amen. There's, there's a whole lot of room. I don't know where, we, where each one of us in this room may be on that scale uh, from 1 to 100. And really, none of us are at 100%. I guarantee that. And so there's a whole lot of room for us to grow uh, in this idea of the fear of the Lord. One thing that we're going to see um, from the scriptures is that the fear of the Lord is actually something we can learn. You can learn the fear of the Lord. You can be taught the fear of the Lord. Taught how to fear God. How to reverence Him. How to respect Him. How to be in awe of Him. How to defer to Him. Amen. I, I don't know about you, but in my life... I want to be more and more successful, whether it's in the area of my money, or maybe it's in the area of my relationships, including my marriage, maybe it's how, how, how well I'm doing health-wise. Do you know the Bible, God's Word has something to say about all of that? Relationships, your physical body, your money. God has a lot to say about different things concerning those things. And so I want to be a success in all of my life. How about you? Is there anybody in here that's just really looking, at, looking forward to being a failure? Oh, man, I, I just can't wait to fail today. Whew, I woke up today just to see if I could fail. Yeah, I, I wonder if I can do that today. No, I don't think, I don't think there's any human being in, in the earth that is looking how to fail or or, or purposing in their heart how to fail. I think a lot of times the issue is, is I, I, it isn't so much I'm looking how to fail, it's maybe I don't know how to succeed. I'm just lacking understanding how to succeed. And as we talk about the fear of the Lord, what you're going to see is, and what we're going to see is, is that the fear of the Lord is a key to success. It's the key to success. Because remember now, the fear of the Lord is to defer to God. Well, let's ask ourselves, when I defer to him, whatever he has to say on the subject <laughs> is always going to lead me to do what? To do the right thing, to be success. So success is wrapped up in this idea of the fear of the Lord. That being said, maybe, maybe, just maybe, if we are finding ourselves in some type of failure in our lives, whether it's relationally, whether it's in the realm of our finances, maybe we physically are not doing so well. Could it be, could it be, if success is attached to the fear of the Lord, referring to Him, deferring to Him, yielding to His will versus my own, if success is attached to the fear of the Lord, if you took the fear of the Lord out, we've got failure. So potentially that in our lives, if we've got some type of breakdown, whether it's in the area of our finances, our physical body, our relationships. Could, could the fear of the Lord actually begin to adjust, begin to adjust and actually fix 
what's broken. And one of the things that you'll see is that the fear of the Lord will always move you to God, not away from God. The f- fear of the Lord brings you to Him. It moves you towards Him. In every single way that you could think of moving towards God, when you are, when you are functioning in the fear of the Lord, you, 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 you are moving towards God. You're seeking Him in your life. You're looking to the Word. You're seeking Him in prayer. You're, you are a person. And again, I think sometimes, I, I think we've got to come to the end of ourselves. Amen. How many of you realize that there has been times in your life you just had to come to the end of yourself? You had to conclude that the way you doing you were doing it wasn't working. Hello, all evidenced by the product of your life. Isn't that right? Right? Some people got marital issues. And, and, and really at the core of that, somewhere there's a lack of the fear of the Lord. Because when there's a fear of the Lord in the marriage between a husband and wife, both the husband and the wife are seeking what God's Word has to say about their part. And when the husband seeks the Lord about what his part is and the wife seeks the Lord about uh, her part is, when they come back together, they're each doing it God's way. You understand? Oh, yeah. And it's all rooted in the fear of the Lord. That being, when I fear God, I'm, I've got to know what He says. And maybe for us to get to the place where we're increasing in the fear of the Lord, we've got to maybe do some self-evaluation, not for the sake of criticism or not for the sake of condemnation, but just for the sake of revelation, being able to look at my life and say, you know, there's some areas of my life that aren't going so well. Has anybody ever been there? There's some areas of my life, maybe in my physical body, it's, it's not going so well. Or maybe in my money, I got, I, I'm lacking some things in the realm of my finances, it's not going so well. Maybe I've got some relational issues, it's not going so well. And I've got to do some evaluation, I've got to conclude, wait a minute, what's the, what's the root of this issue? What's the root of this issue? And potentially, and maybe more more likely that there's a lack of the fear of the Lord in our lives in a a specific area where we've not sought the Lord out, we've not deferred to Him and His ways, and because we've not deferred to Him and His ways, we've got the fruit of our own way. You understand? When you choose to do it your way, you get the fruit of your way. The fruit is what? The manifestation of your choice. I'm going to do it my way. Right? I don't care. I don't care what they think. I don't care. Woo! We're in a dangerous place when we get that, that little attitude, that I don't care. And what you're saying is, I'm going to do it my way, and there's no deference. There's no fear of the Lord. It's going to be my way. And the deal is, you'll eat the fruit of your own way. So we all do, right? We've all, we've all done it. I've eaten the fruit of my own way. Amen? Anybody else? Well, you don't even have to say yes. I know it's true anyways. <laughs> Praise God. I know how this works. So our goal in, in, in teaching on the subject of the fear of the Lord is to, we want to increase our value. Amen? We want to... We want to give it attention, which is giving it value, so that if we're going to increase it in the fear of the Lord, we're going to have to know some things about it, know what it is, uh, what the benefits are, what it looks like in manifestation, and certainly the Scriptures help us to see that. Um, praise God. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 11. As we talk on the subject of the fear of the Lord, Isaiah chapter 11, look with me there to verse 1. Isaiah 11, verses, verse 1, and, and through several of these verses, uh, I will say this, they are messianic, messianic, Scriptures, And what that means is they are prophetic 
pictures of Jesus himself 700 plus years before Jesus comes. So, so as we read through Isaiah, a book that's written, like I said, probably 700 plus years before Jesus ever comes, God is writing of his son. God's talking about Jesus before he ever comes. And that's what we see here in Isaiah chapter 11. It says in verse 1, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. We're talking about Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Huh. So Jesus himself functioned in and walked in the fear of the Lord. He had the fear of the Lord in his life. Praise God. Verse uh, 3 says, his, his delight is in the fear of the Lord. Glory to God. He delighted in the fear of the Lord. What, what are we saying? He, he delighted in reverencing. He de delighted in respecting. He delighted in deferring to his daddy. He took delight in doing that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now remember, we, we're not teaching on it, but we're, we're talking about becoming more like who? Last, la becoming more like Jesus. Well, we see here that Jesus was a man who functioned in the fear of the Lord when he was on the earth. He functioned in the fear of the Lord. Praise God. And it says here that he took delight in the fear of the Lord. Look, I, I, I took note of this. at ver, Verse 3, it says, his delight is in the fear of the Lord. It, it seemed to me that it made sense that because Jesus, if you, if you took out the fear of the Lord, let's just say the fear of the Lord is not addressed. Jesus is not functioning in the spirit of the Lord could he have a full manifestation of the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of wisdom and understanding? Would, would, there, would Jesus have been able to function in all of that without the fear of the Lord? He wouldn't have. Because he would never be deferring to his Father. He'd always be doing, listen, his own thing. So we're seeing here that it would seem to me that one of the keys to Jesus' success in ministry, and, and could we say that Jesus was a success? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not just in, understand, sometimes we oftentimes think of being successful, that, that him going to the cross. Yes, that was part of it. But remember now, he lived, he lived 33 and a half years of his life. Jesus was, was, a, was a, even in his young, young age, walked in the fear of the Lord. He was successful as a young man. He was successful as an adolescent. He was successful as a young adult. He was successful in, in all that he did. The Bible says here that he functioned in the fear of the Lord. The, that, let's ask ourselves this. What level of fear of the Lord did he have? Did he have an extreme, extreme reverence for his father? Intense reverence. Intense respect and value for God and his father. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, let's just go there. Just this gives us a picture. It's not talking about the fear of the Lord, but we are we're seeing we can see that the fear of the Lord would bring Jesus to this place. Well, maybe that am I saying it? No. It isn't Luke chapter 2. Where was it uh, that Jesus at 12 years old was in the temple? Oh, it is. It's two, it is chapter 2. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, so it's uh, verse Look with me to 240. Let's pick it up with the 40th verse of chapter 2. Now remember, we saw in Isaiah 11 that Jesus functioned in the fear of the Lord. The Spirit of God was upon him, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. 
So we could also say that, we could say that for us also, that the Holy Spirit who dwells in us is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Amen? That if we would just, let, let's say it this way, if we would just defer to our heart, <laughs> sometimes that's a challenge, isn't it? Because our born-again spirit, when we accepted Jesus Christ, our spirit became born again. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord dwells in us. Same spirit that Jesus has and had dwells in us. Maybe that's sometimes the issue, that we're not deferring to our inner man. You know, your inner man will probably do things a whole lot different than your outer man. The problem is, is you get, the reality is, is we all get in trouble when we live from our outer man and not from our inner man. Two, uh, chapter 2, verse 40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know... Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers. So they went a day's journey. It took them a day to get back. Then they spent another day looking for him. Right? In three days, they, Jesus is missing. But notice it says, So it was that after three days they found him where? In the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers. What do you, what do you think the foundation of that is? The fear of the Lord. Why? He's seeking his Father. He's seeking to understand. He's seeking to grow in his understanding of his Father, his Word. He's wanting to be a, a young man growing in his reverence, his respect, and in, in his awe of God. How many 12-year-olds do you know that are asking, I really would like to go to church? Correct. And now listen, we, we need to, sometimes we need to address that even in our own selves because I was a parent and my kids were not screaming to go to church. <laughs> Amen? Sometimes we need to take responsibility as parents. Amen? So we see that Jesus is he's in the temple, in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions, says here in the New King James. So what is his passion for? Now, I want to know the will of my father. I want to know the will of my father. A 12-year-old boy has sanctified himself. He set himself apart. And if we're seeing this as a, in this little, we just seeing this one glimpse, a three-day picture of Jesus' life at 12 years old, do we not think that he conducted himself this way all the time? Very sanctified, meaning set apart. I mean, he's probably not doing what, what, what all the other kids are doing. It doesn't say, and Jesus was sitting with a whole bunch of 12-year-olds. That there were so many 12-year-olds there listening to the teachers. It makes no reference to anyone else his age being there. He's sitting amongst the teachers. And doesn't say, and all the other kids. No, he's very, he's very different. And it isn't just because he's the Son of God. It's because he understands that he needs to learn. He's passionate about growing in his understanding of God, his Father, and God's purpose for his life. He's not, Jesus is not interested in doing his own thing. I really like this. It goes on to say, And all who heard him were astonished at, verse 47, at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this, done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Right? 12 years old. What's your mindset? How old are you? No, no, ask, no, I mean, 
right? We talked about the importance of if we're going to make adjustments in the fear of the Lord, we've got to do self-evaluation. Not for condemnation, not to beat ourselves up and say, I'm such a loser. That's not the purpose. It's to be able to make some adjustments. Be able to make some adjustments specifically in this idea of the fear of the Lord. And so Jesus is 12 years old. He says, should I not be about my father? Did you not know that I'd be about my father's business? Well, let me ask you, are you a Christian today? Yes. Is his father your father? Yes. Should you be about his, yes. his what? Yes. His business. Should you be about his business? Then you, you need to discern what that looks like for you. I mean, I, I, mean, I can't answer. There's, there's certainly general business that applies to all of us, but there's specific business that God has for every one of us in this room. You are, every one of you in this room have an assignment. You're not here by accident. There's specific places that you're supposed to be. And if we don't have this mindset, which is the foundation of this, the foundation of being about the Father's business is the fear of the Lord. You take that foundation out. You take the fear of the Lord out and you're not about his business, but you're about whose business? I'm about my business. So this isn't listen, don't let this be a heavy. This is about help. You need help. I need I need help. Man, it takes a humble man and a humble woman to say, I need some help. My life is, is not revealing all that it could. And even, listen, even if you've made some progress, whatever progress you have made is attached to somewhere in your life you've got the fear of the Lord working. And whatever progress you have made, let's just say there's more progress to be made. Amen. And if you're going to see victory, and if you're going to see change, and you're going to see those situations that you would say are not all they could be, to become all that they could be, it will begin with and continue with the fear of the Lord. Because if you take the fear of the Lord out, you're not about His business. You're about your own. <laughs> Let's just hold hands and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> oh. mm. <laughs> that was weighty. Right? Weighty in a good way. Yes. That's weighty in a good way. That's, that's the Spirit of the Lord do, do, speaking something to your heart. Now listen, listen. if, you do, if your heart doesn't receive it, if your heart doesn't receive it, guess what? We stay the same. The sower sows the, sows the Word. The sower sows the Word. God's trying to help you with His Word. God is a sower. He knows there's no harvest without a planting. And he's planting today. He's planting today. What kind of soil are you? Well, I, you know, I, I, you know, I like coming to church. I like the music. The music's good. People are pretty friendly. That's all good. What's your response to the word? Well, you know, I like, I like the couples fellowship. That's fun. And, you know, we like doing all those kinds of things. And, yeah, yeah, that's good. What, what's your response to the word? Jesus said you'll know the truth. What? You'll know the truth. And the truth will do what? It sets you free. What is your greatest need for? Oh, well, you know, I'd like a, a Whopper from Burger King. <laughs> your greatest need is not a Whopper from Burger King. Even, even, let me just say, your greatest need is not for fellowship with one another, though that's good. It's a part of the puzzle. But our greatest need is to know the truth. Amen? Amen. Know the truth. And the truth does what? Set you free. Well, you know, I think I'm all right. Yeah, I bet you do think you're all right. (laughs) 
There isn't a person in here that, that the Lord's intent for you is greater freedom. You may have a, you, certainly in your spirit, you are spiritually free, but there's ways of thinking that, that go, you have, everyone in this room still has ways of thinking that are oppositional to the truth. Amen. Praise God. So Jesus is, is a 12-year-old boy. He's aware of his assignment. I like that because here's what it says, that, that we have kids in our children's ministry. I really, our children's ministry, our, we want our kids to be on the Father's assignment. Isn't that right? We want our children to know the, the, this, this scripture here is powerful to, to minister to young people because we could say, listen, Jesus was, uh, listen, God's never opposed to soccer. He's not opposed to baseball, but he never wants soccer and baseball and all those, all those things to have a greater uh, emphasis in our children's lives or our own lives above his word. And if Jesus was successful in his life, we know according to Isaiah that he had the spirit of the fear of the Lord. He delighted in the fear of the Lord. It was his delight. He took pleasure in reverencing his father. He took pleasure in saying no to himself and saying yes to his father. Amen? The foundation of that is the fear of the Lord. The foundation of that is the fear of the Lord. Doing the father's will. Doing his business. Amen? Mm -hmm. Go with me to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Let's look at the early church. We'll look at some New Testament scriptures. Just so that we're... I want to kind of spend a little time today in the New Testament. Just so that we understand that the fear of the Lord is not just an Old Testament perspective. It's something that is addressed also in the New Testament. And if it's addressed in the New Testament, it's for who? Usins. It's usins. That's for usins. Glory to God. The fear of the Lord's for... You ought to just say the fear of the Lord's for me. Yeah, the fear of the Lord's for me. The fear of the Lord is for me. Uh, Acts chapter 9. Look with me to verse 31. Acts 9, 31. It says, Then the churches... Throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So what did the churches of the early church... Now remember, this is the book of Acts, so the church has just launched out, basically. The, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has just been launched out. And it says here that they were walking in the fear of the Lord. It was their practice. They were established in the fear of the Lord. Walking in the fear of the Lord. Praise God. And if the early church was walking in the fear of the Lord, it would make sense that... <laughs> you would think the older the church is, the smarter we might get. Right? I mean, you know, the early church, you know, you take an infant, infant church. You know. But this infant church was probably far more successful than what we, we're seeing in the church today. And that potentially, that potentially, the reason that they were more successful than we are is because it says here they were walking in the fear of the Lord. Which, 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 listen, would imply this. The church, the early church, was very focused on the Lord's business and not their own. We've become independent. The United States is a country that celebrates independence. Certainly we should celebrate independence from tyranny, governmental oppression. But we should never celebrate independence from the will of our Father. The 
The problem is, is we pride ourselves in independence, and it translates into our lives in so many areas. The idea of independence is, I want to do what I want to do. How many of you ha ha have kids? You have, you have any kids that, are, that have, an have ever had, because they're grown up now, right? That had attitudes of independence, going to do it my way. Right? How's that, how's that as a parent make you feel? Does that, does that make you feel all fluffy? Like, oh, this is wonderful. I love a rebellious kid. We ought to have 10 of them. Right? No. No, that doesn't do anything for you but, but rub you wrong. Is that right? Independence. Honey, I'd like you to clean your room. Well, I, well, I don't want, I don't want to clean my room. And you know they go off. It's uh, what is it? It's independence, independence, self-willed. And if we if we allow our kids to continue in that, it is is a let, let's say it this way: it's a lack of reverence for you, you as a parent. Irreverence. They, they don't have a reverence for you. They don't respect you. They don't awe you when they back talk to you. And, and they don't do what you ask them to do. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Listen, listen. Did you like it in your kids? Do you like that independence in your kids? You shouldn't like it in yourself. Oh, 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 whoa, whoa, right? Oh, it's easy to point at the kids. It's easy to go, I need to beat that rebellion out of you. And yet, would you, would you, would you, would you take the same approach with yourself? Would you address your own self? Would you, would you not understand that you have a relationship with your heavenly, heavenly Father, and if you have no reverence for Him, then you're walking in independence. You're not deferring to Him. You're doing your own thing. Praise God. <laughs> Woo, we're getting some help today. Glory to God. We just saved some folks from counseling. Glory to God. <laughs> You think I'm laughing? You think you're laughing? You apply the truth you're hearing today. You address the fear of your Lord, the Lord. You, it will save some marriage counseling, some other types of counseling in your life. I'm telling you, if the word of the Lord, if you know the truth, the truth sets you free, why would you have to go to a counselor? If God's word will set you free, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I don't have a problem with counselors. You need a counselor, go see one. But at the end of the day, the only thing that truly can set you free is the truth. Amen? You save yourself a lot of money, a lot of time, sitting in, sitting in front of somebody who probably don't know what they're talking about anyways. Praise God. Go to the Hebrews chapter 12. Y'all doing all right? Oh, thank you, Lord. Hebrews chapter 12. And look with me there to verse 28. Hebrews 12, 28. Listen, this is good for all of us, myself included. I mean, I, need, I, I, I can, the, my level of the fear of the Lord can be increasing. Amen? It'll, it'll affect our, if you adjust this stuff in your own life, when you come to church, you'll have a greater fear of the Lord, a greater, greater reverence for Him. You'll, you, you and I will, be, will be, have more focus about, upon Him. There'll be a, a, we're more about His business uh, in, in our days. Amen? We'll have a greater, here I will say this, we'll have a greater manifestation of His presence where there's the fear of the Lord. Amen? Where we have the fear of the Lord in our lives. How do you respond to reverence? Parentally or even relationally, when somebody reverences you, 
There, there, it's the idea of also honor, to revere and to honor. And it isn't even about feeling. It's just about uh, the response that comes out of you uh, naturally when people revere you and honor you. I'm not talking about worshiping you. I'm talking about just having a reverence for you. I think when my kids are reverential to, to me, my, uh, my generosity uh, would be at a higher level. Now, understand, what I, I would say my generosity, generosity is the attitude of the heart, if, if that makes sense to you. The manifestation of generosity would be uh, how much I'm allowed to be generous in manifestation, in my behavior. So you as a parent are generous. It's who you are. It's, it's part of your character, your nature. You're a, gen, you're a giver. I want to help my kids. But their irreverence or reverence is going to dictate the release of or the manifestation of your generosity. Is that right? Come on. I want to... And there's nobody always going to be, we're not going to be perfect at this. But what we are, we're, we're people that are coming together, willing to make adjustments, willing to humble ourselves, willing to lower ourselves in this idea of the fear of the Lord, bringing ourselves under so that God could have His greatest manifestation both in my life personally and in our church gathering when we come together. We want, we want Him to have his, his way. And the fear of the Lord in the hearts of people is a key to that. Uh, Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Notice that grace is in the same subject. Grace is not a contrary subject. The fear of the Lord does not go contrary to grace. They work together. Because oftentimes we, we, we're, we, we, th we think that, you know, the idea of grace, certainly unmerited favor, uh, we understand that. But obviously we're seeing grace in the same context as reverence and the godly fear. They obviously work together. Isn't that right? Let us have grace by which we may, notice this, serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So that, that implies that there's an acceptable way to serve God. Acceptably implies well-pleasing. So we serve God. Let, let's say this too. Let's, let's, let's bring this, in, this idea in. People that are functioning in the fear of the Lord, are, they serve easily. They serve God and His purposes. Why? Because they're not on their own agenda. They're not about their own business. They're about God's business. So that is, you know, when you, when you have the fear of the Lord in your life, serving other people, serving certainly in the church or other ways, you become a servant, serving, serving God. Let me just say, serving God will always look like serving people somehow. It isn't, yeah, well, I'm just, I serve God. I, I serve God, God, I serve God, yes. I'm a servant of God. <laughs> okay. So wasn't Jesus. And God, Jesus, in serving God, did what? Served people. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to do what? Serve. He's on assignment. He said, I'm not about my business. I'm about the Father's business, which the Father's business was about what? Serving. Serving. People that have a hard time serving lack the fear of God. They're lacking the fear of the Lord in their lives. Which means they're about their own business. They're not about God's business. They're doing their own thing. 
Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably or well-pleasing with reverence and godly fear. With reverence and godly fear. So reverence and godly fear become the foundation of service. Amen? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Peter 1, 17. I'll say this too, and we'll see this in 1 Peter 1, 17. That the fear of the Lord be becomes like a boundary in your life. So when you have the fear of the Lord in your heart, it, it, it becomes a boundary in your life, in your heart, your heart attitude, the fear of the Lord. It will cause you to have boundaries. There's certain things you won't do, certain things you won't say. Certain places you won't go. Why? Because you fear God. You have the fear of God in your life. You have a greater reverence for Him. Amen? You respect Him. Because I respect Him, I'm not going to do anything that's unacceptable. We're to serve God acceptably. That is well-pleasing. That would imply that there is, some, there is a service to God that would be displeasing. A behavior and actions that would not be pleasing. Amen? Doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Doesn't mean that you're not going to heaven. That's not what we're talking about. It's talking about just simply pleasing God. Do you want to please God? Do you want, do you want your children to please you? If you've got kids, do you want your kids to, be, to, to act towards you in an acceptable way or a pleasing way? In reverence. Reverence is acceptable. Reverence is pleasing. When your kids are reverent to you, it is, it's pleasing. And what God is saying is when you're reverent to me, it's pleasing, which, which would imply the opposite. Yes? If one is true, the opposite has to be true. Irreverence displeases God. Doesn't cause him to stop loving you. It will cause him to have to correct you. Amen. And you'll just go, thank you, Lord. Thank you for correcting me. Because your irreverence is going to take you in a bad place. Is that right? Ooh, it has for every one of us. <laughs> Some of you might be there now in a bad place. Ask yourself about the fear of the Lord. Where have I, where have I not deferred to Him? Wherever you didn't defer to Him, that's where you made your own choice. You didn't consult Him. You didn't get counsel from him because he never counseled you in the wrong direction. Not ever. <laughs> Amen? Right? So Peter says here, Peter, like all the men of God, none of them did it all right. No, not, not any of them did it all right. So take some pressure off yourself. Pressure in this, in this sense, that get out of condemnation. Whenever you're walking in self-condemnation, you're not going to walk in victory. Come on. You won't, you won't even do it right when you're self-condemning. You'll have no motivation to even do it right. Verse 17 says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves... Conduct. Could we, could we, we could say it this way, behave, right? Con conduct and behavior, synonymous thoughts, right? Conduct yourselves throughout your time of your stay here in what? Fear. So fear is the foundation of what? Conduct, behavior. Conduct yourself in your stay here. What's he talking about? While you're here on the earth. I think we're all still here in the earth, right? You all look like you're still here. Notice it says, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here. I like that, throughout your time. What does he say? He's talking about the whole time you're here, every day, every, from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, every day to the time you depart here, conduct your life in fear. Reverence, respect, Ah, deferring to him? Yes. 
Hallelujah. This smile is so good. Whew. Thank you, Lord. He's helping us. Oh, he's helping us. Conduct, conduct yourselves throughout your time. Throughout your time. Is he talking about a short time? Is he talking about all, all the time? All the time. How important is fear? He's saying it's got to be integrated into all the time you're here in the earth. <laughs> there's never a day, there's never a moment that we suspend the fear of the Lord. Oh, oh, we're, we're just suspending the fear of the Lord. Do you know what's going to happen? Oh, you're going to begin to do your thing. You won't be deferring to God. You're just going to be on your own plan. My, I'm going to do things my own way. And then you'll, listen, whenever you're doing things in your own way, most likely you're hurting someone else. Yeah. Most likely you're hurting yourself and or hurting someone else. Amen? Praise God. And if you call on the Father, I like that. Daddy, Daddy, listen. You're going to call, he calls you son. You call him Father. Everything else that's said right there is an expectation from him as the Father. He's saying, if you're going to call me Father, here's what I expect of you. Yes? <laughs> right? If you, and if you call on the Father... All scriptures by inspiration of God. This is God inspired. He's saying, if you're going to call me daddy, here's what I expect out of you. Right? What do you expect out of your kids? They're going to call you daddy. What is that saying? They're saying, you're my supply. You're my provider. You're my protector. You're the one who loves me. And, and now listen, you and your expectation of Joshua and Timothy is that they conduct themselves throughout their time in your home, and certainly after they leave, in what? Fear. Reverence of who? You. That being in, in your relationship with them, you expect them to revere you. Is that appropriate? Yeah. Absolutely appropriate. Absolutely appropriate. If it's appropriate on a human level, this level is at a higher level. Is that not right? Come on. And so this is God speaking to us as his kids, saying, you're calling me daddy. If you're going to call out to me as daddy, when you call on him as your father, you're calling on him. What's he, what, do you, what are you calling on him for? Daddy, I, you know, I need a new car. Daddy, I, you know, the rent's due. Daddy, my body is sick. It needs healing. My, daddy, what, what is it? He, he's saying, I'm your all-sufficiency. I'm your supply. I'm your everything. If you're going to call me your everything, then here's what I expect out of you. If you're going to call me daddy, and all that implies, right? The Father implies something, right? It's not just a term. It implies something. Right? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> church is fun. I'm telling you, church is fun. The Word is fun. The Word is awesome. Isn't it? Glory to God. If you're going to call me Daddy... Who without partiality judges according to each one's work. Conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. 1 Peter 2.17. Look with me there. Again, we're just, we're just establishing that the, the fear of the Lord, the subject of fearing God and the fear of the Lord is both a New Testament principle and an Old Testament principle. It's a New Covenant principle as, as well as an Old Covenant principle. So... It was talked about in the Old Covenant, but it has translated also into the New Covenant. Amen? 2.17, 1 Peter. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Those are instructions, right? This is what we're supposed to be doing. Honor all people. Treat everyone with what? Value. 
Love the brotherhood. He's talking about Christians. Talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ. Love them. Fear God. And honor the king. If you live under a king. In our, in our listen, in our, in our country, it's a president. Honor the king or honor the president. Honor him. Doesn't say honor him if. It says honor him. Not if. There's no ifs in here. Doesn't say honor all people if. Love the brotherhood if and when. No qualifiers. You do what you're supposed to do in spite of what other people do. Fear God. Honor the king or the president. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll end with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's pick it up with the 14th verse. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14. Y'all doing all right? says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship? So, so we're talking about yoke, being yoked with an unbeliever. It's talking about having intimate fellowship with. Having an intimate fellowship with. Do not be unequally yoked with, together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? So what's significant about unbelievers is their behavior, their conduct. It's the idea of lawlessness. Do we want to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes, absolutely. But what he's talking about is not, not finding yourself practicing and involved in the fellowshipping with the behaviors that they have. You've been set free from that stuff. You came out of darkness into the light of God. Amen? Don't go get back into darkness. Don't begin to have fellowship with the, what they do, how they handle life, all of that kind of stuff. What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Well, let's ask ourselves, and concerning the fear of the Lord, people that are lawless, are they, do they have the fear of the Lord in their life? Lawlessness. No fear of God. It's a lawlessness. There are no boundaries. Lawlessness speaks of no boundaries. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't care what you think about it. Amen? I mean, this is what lawlessness is. It's, it's you, you can't put boundaries on them. You can't, you can't tell them, clean up your room. You tell them to clean up their room, it's, it's I am not cleaning up my room. What is that? Lawlessness. Amen? You love them, but you got to correct them. Amen? Well, the Bible says the rod of correction. We need a little rod of correction coming on, right? Amen. What communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God, as God has said. I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Ooh, that's, a, that's an awesome promise, isn't it? I will dwell in them. I'm going to dwell in you. I'm going to walk among you. I will be their God. Whew, what a, I will be their God. Think about all that that involves. I will be your God. What is he saying? It would be just like saying, I will be your father. I'm supreme. I'm all-powerful. I'm all-knowing. <laughs> There's nothing I can't do. I'm your God. I want to be your God. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, because of this, come out from among them, implying what? Believers with unbelievers. Come out from among who? What's the context? Previous is, 
The idea of being unequally yoked with unbelievers, having fellowship and intimate walk with unbelievers. Right? You will watch, the more intimate you get with unbelievers, the, you will find that they will affect you more than you will affect them. Come on. Now, obviously, the Lord has a passion for us, and He wants us to, to reach them with the gospel. Amen? Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore... Because of this, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves. So we're talking about believers, right? We're talking about believers to cleansing ourselves. What are you saying? Stop doing what you're doing. Cleanse yourself. Discontinue with the behaviors that you're involved with. Discontinue with being unequally yoked with unbelievers, the way they're doing things. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Notice this perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Doing what? Perfecting holiness. That word perfecting, in some places in the scripture, it imp implies maturing, but, but it, it, it implies this in this context. It says perfecting, meaning uh, perfecting holiness. It's the idea of moral purity, holiness. Perfecting moral purity in the fear of God. So how do I perfect holiness, moral conduct, in the fear of God? What's the foundation of doing the right thing? The fear of God. You take the fear of God out. When, when, you know, when the fear of God is not in place, believers will go out to nightclubs, They'll go out and get drunk. They'll go out and have sex outside of marriage. I'm, t I'm just telling you, this, this, this goes on in the church. It goes on in the church. It's happened in this church. I've been doing this for 15 years. We've seen people, uh, we've seen people come in and it just, you know, you love them, but they're, 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 they're lawless. There's lawlessness in the church. Believers, they call them call ourselves believers. Now I'm not judging people. I'm saying it is behaviors that you, they've not come out from the world. They're still part of the world, doing things the way the world does it. And the Bible says we're to be perfecting holiness, not being more like the world. He's saying being less like the world, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There'll be no perfecting of holiness unless the fear of the fear of God, reverence, respect, awe, and a deference to Him. Always. O always. Well, I, I was thinking about going here. Well, wait a minute. What would reverence say? What would reverence do? Should I defer here? Is that a good choice? Come on. Oh, no, listen, I'm not I'm not ministering to you my ideas. We are ministering the Word of God. And if you are having a wrestling match with anything that's being said today, your wrestling match isn't with me. Your wrestling match is with the one who wrote this. Chew on that for a bit, right? Oh, it's easy to have a wrestling match with the pastor. It really is. Well, I don't like what he said. Your problem is, is not with what he said, it's what, with what he said the Father said. You know, it's easy to say, I don't like what he said. Jesus said, are you going to kill me, a man who's told you the truth? Are you going to kill me, a man who has told you the truth? Why would he say that? Because that's what they were thinking. They didn't like what they were hearing. It didn't set well with them, and yet it was the, it was the truth. Rubbed him wrong. If we just get rid of him, we won't have to listen to this anymore. <laughs> right? Not so. God will just raise up another one. Go ahead. 
Go ahead. They'd killed the prophets. They'd killed them. They killed him, but God would just raise up another prophet. <laughs> Amen. We're to perfect holiness in the fear of God. How important is the fear of the Lord? Foundation for all success becomes a, it becomes a the foundation for all ex- success. Reverence, respect. Listen. Wh- let me let me say this too. When you have reverence for God, faith is easy. Faith is absolutely a piece of cake. When, you, when you've dealt with reverencing, respecting, honor, and deferring to Him, faith becomes, it just, it's like water. You function in faith very easy. You, you do. That would say to me that if I'm struggling with faith in an area, I've got to maybe address the idea of the fear of the Lord. Right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If I have no reverence for him, then faith can't come. Right? If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but I have no, no fear of the Lord in my life, how can faith come? It can't. Impossible. No fear, no reverence, no faith. Because if I don't respect him, I won't respect what he says. And I'll have no confidence in it because I have no respect. I'm not in awe and I'm not deferring to him. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Wow. I launched out by faith today, guys. I just did. I just, I just did. I launched out by faith. I, I felt in my heart I needed to head in this direction. The Lord confirmed it to me. He spoke to me in my spirit and I just... Uh, he, he encouraged me. I want you to speak on this subject. And uh, I, I, I did. I, I, I launched out by faith today. Glory to God. And the Lord met me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord met us today. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, we do thank you for this day and for your word. And Father, we hold your word in high esteem. Father, in the coming weeks as we discuss fearing you, Daddy, I... I uh, I know I personally want to make adjustments in my life. I want a greater success moving forward, Father. And I, think, I know you're helping me as, you're, as much as you're helping anyone who's hearing. You're helping me to be able to get some things in order that you might be able to accomplish all that you're, you've dreamed and desired for me, for this ministry, and for this people. And Father, we just choose a way of humility. We see that there's areas in our lives that still need much work. And Father, we're seeing today the fear of the Lord is a foundation of these things. Help us. Instruct us. Teach us to fear you. And we'll give you all the glory, honor, and praise for it today in Jesus' name. I want to give anybody an opportunity here today. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, Sometimes we can be religious and think we're okay, but we're really not.